And that's now the ninth chapter. If somebody will read the first three verses of chapter nine. Bill. Do you think it's just human nature that we, I'll say it correctly, we tend to take provision for granted? You know, God, God provides out of the goodness of his heart, out yep. of his care and love for us. Yep. And we as people, now and then, just tend to minimize it and just take it like we had it coming to us. You know, I, I, Christian entitlement? I see it all the time. Where people will, they, they will reference Second Chronicles 7, 15, uh, and then say, God come heal our land. And it's like, whoa, what about the if my people, if my people, if, you know, there's all these prerequisites. And people want to skip all the steps and say, give me. Right. And God, I don't think God works that way. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I'm glad you said that because of where, I think where we're going to go here. Um, so, first three verses, chapter 9. Now on the 20th and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord of their, their God one fourth part of the day. Mm. And another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Wow. All right. So the day after the Feast of Tabernacles is now this day of repentance. And it says they fasted. So nobody's eating anything. They confessed their sins. And they, let's say, dressed the part. It says they wore what? Sackcloth. Okay. Um, our English word sack actually comes from the Hebrew word sah, which was a material made of goat's hair, and it was used to make sacks for carrying grain and stuff like that. Uh, it was very inexpensive and very uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Uh, and very itchy, uh, and it wasn't made for clothing. You're not supposed to wear it, except on days like this. And to wear it, and to literally cut yourself a, a custom suit out of it or a dress out of it uh, is going to keep you in a constant state of scratching and discomfort. Now, uh, I will say some of you freak out if, if you got a garment tag on the back of your neck. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, how many of you cut the tags out of your clothes? Yeah, me too. All right. Now, imagine an entire outfit made out of tags. Uh, that that <laughs> might, might help you imagine, you know, uh, the effect of sackcloth on the body, but it's far worse. Um, uh, and, and the whole idea of sackcloth is that um, it, um, it has an effect on your body, and in a, it, it helps you get into the miserable mindset to repent of your sins. You understand? You feel miserable. You are physically uh, ah, uh, completely miserable. And uh, it helps you feel miserable. And then you just transition uh, that into your, your repenting of your prayers. And you add to that, they're, they're not eating. It says they're not eating. So stomachs are growling. Perhaps everybody's a bit crabby because of it. <laughs> and it says they got a bunch of what in their hair? Earth, dirt, dust. So they actually have a bunch of dirt in their hair. You literally would pick up a bunch of dirt and, and you just cover your head and you, you fill up your hair with dirt. Uh, because you're there to confess your dirt. And you're sitting out in the sun with about another 30,000 people who are fasting, wearing dirt in their hair, uh, in, and they're in sackcloth, and you get the picture. And for three hours, they read from the law, followed by three hours of confession and worship. And before they did all this, it says they separated themselves from foreigners, because this experience was only for the Jews, because there's some foreigners there, but it's only for the Jews, and it wouldn't mean anything to anybody else anyway. So this is just a, a wonderful thing that the Jews get to experience. It was almost like Woodstock, but not quite. Yes, but no music. <laughs> but no Jimmy Hendrix. <clears throat> and they wore clothes. And they, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So um, now. Do I want to go there? Do I want to go there? Okay. Money must 
Oh, I'm just thinking of, mm, I don't think I need to go there. All right, let's go, uh, uh, somebody read verse uh, uh, four through six, four, five, and six. Oh, no, never mind. You, you hate the names. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just, That's oh my gosh. Here. What am I saying? <laughs> yeah, it, it's just no fun. Uh, so, uh, verse four, then Yeshua. Uh, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebania, Buni, Sherevia, Bani, and uh, Henani stood at the altars uh, of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, ha, um, Hash, Hashhabenya, Sherevia, Hudia, Shebania, Pet, uh, Petahia, said, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. <coughs> Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. And Ezra said, you are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heavens of heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. Right in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 1. To all of them you give life, and the host of heaven, all the angels, worship you. So, um, whenever God wanted to encourage his people, he would point to creation around them and remind them that he had made all of it. You're, Recognize in the Bible, does any verses come to mind? You think of how often God would say, you know, just remind them of what he did. Okay. Uh, but when Israel then turned to idols, they often, as they often did, you know, God disciplines them. Uh, because in his eyes, uh, all idolatry was like adultery. Because he had wedded them on Mount Sinai uh, when he gave them his covenant. Uh, and so, God would point them to creation, remind them he made everything. That's why they don't, they're not supposed to worship any false idol, any false god, because they didn't do nothing. Um, and he uses the same approach to remind them of the foolishness of worshiping idols. Uh, we saw that how often in, in the, so far where we've been going on Wednesday nights. Um, and um, here's the nation of Israel. Again, well, the, the remnant. Rebuilding, but still surrounded by idol worshippers, idolaters. So it's a good place for Ezra to start where God always starts, where the Word of God starts, where the law, the Torah starts. In the beginning, God created. You understand? Mm -hmm. Here's what's so important about the, the God of the Bible and the Jewish God. They were the only folks who were monotheists. They're the only folks saying there's only one God who made everything. All the other religions would say, oh, there's a God of the trees, a God of the sky, a God of the stars. The stars are gods. The moon is a God. The sun is a God. Right? There's a God of the oceans. There's a God of this, a God of that, a God of this. I mean, that's in every, pretty much every pagan religion. That's in Wicca. That's in all that stuff. And you got God, uh, you know, the Jewish folks who believe in one God who made everything. Everything else is created but God. One creator, everything else is created. And God himself was never created. God has always existed. Okay, completely opposite of any other world religion back then. <clears throat> so this is the starting point. This is the starting point. Ezra goes right back to what they know from the very opening of the word that we have. The Jewish law. That God, in God's sovereignty, gave to Moses. I want you to think about this. Remember, Moses is the one who writes what we call the Torah. The first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He writes them down. God feeds it to him. What's the very first thing God wanted Moses to record? The creation. Because again, when Moses was writing it, God was saying, you know, which Moses knew, this is first and foremost how he is different from all these other so-called gods. Number one, there's only one God who made everything that we see, including the people that believe in these other so-called gods. So, great way to start. Um, and then, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, e even today, the faithful Jews rec recite the Shema, right? That, that's their declaration of, in faith uh, in the one and only God. Shema Yisrael, 
you know, um, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai El Echad, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's, there's, there's meaning, it's me, I'm the God, the only God, um, and there's a little bit of a, for us Christians, we'd say a, a Trinity, Trinitarian um, statement in there. The Lord your God is one. Hmm. So, um, what, what is going to follow, <clears throat> now uh, we're going to go into a, a prayer. And what you're going to see next, starting at verse 6, um, and, and just I'm going to tell you, tell you what it is, and then we're going to read it. It's going to take a while. So I need, I need a good reader who's just going to go through it. All right? Um, and, I'm, and, and I want you to emphasize a certain word in particular. <clears throat> but here's the deal. Chapter, the rest of chapter 9, it is a spiritual summary of the Old Testament history of the Jews. The creation is going to be verse 6. The call of Abraham is going to be 7 and 8. The Exodus, 9 to 14. The nation's wilderness experience that we just talked about, verses 15 to 23. The conquering of the land of Canaan, 24, 25. The, the period of the judges, 26 to 29. The period of the prophets, all the way to captivity, verse 30, 31. And then uh, it will say, now therefore, verse 32, and that brings us up to Ezra's day and the need for the nation to repent and confess of sin. So if you want to review the Old Testament in a glance, just read this following prayer, because it's a prayer that starts at verse 7. And, and, and the priests, in one, this is one of the longest prayers in the Bible, this priest right, retells the story of, of their people up to the present. And for some of you, uh, I'd say it's a summary of sorts of your own life. Okay? It's a summary of sorts of your own life. Uh, and I want you to keep in mind, though, that it's all about God and not us. And I want you to notice how many times it says you in the prayer. Yep. You or yourself. And so um, uh, who, who, who wants to pray, read this? It's a be a long, fun one. Okay. You wanted to read? I think your hand was up first. Okay. So every time you get to you. Or yourself. I mean, you. I mean, give it the emphasis. And watch this. It's all about God. And that's how it should be anyway. When we pray, God, it's about you, what you've done, and not us. Ready? I want you to take it the whole chapter. Go. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before oh, you. 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 Found, his heart. found his heart faithful before you. And made a covenant with him it, to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Jebusites, and the Gergeshites. Gir 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 to give it to his descendants. <laughs> you Sorry. have performed your yeah. words, for you are righteous. <laughs> you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his hand. For you knew that they had acted proudly against them, so you made a name for yourself, as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea and the dry, on the dry land. And their, persecu their persecutors you threw into the deep, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy, your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hard in their necks, and did not keep your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they, point, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abound, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them, even when they made a molded calf for themselves, and said, This is your God that brought you out of Egypt, and worked great pro provocations 
Yet in your manful mercy, you did, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sishon, the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied you also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go into and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land. They might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and rich land and possessed houses full of goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they you Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and killed your prophets who testified against them, to turn themselves to yourself, and they were great provocations. Therefore, you... Yeah, let me pause you right there. All right, y'all tracking so far? Yeah. Well, what's the point of the prayer? You. You. God. God. No, God's great heart. You got it all. We messed up. Okay, all right. So, so far, like I said... It's a review of the Old Testament, isn't it? I mean, actually pretty good amount of detail for what it is. And clearly, God is in the right. God's people have been in the wrong. You did this, but we did this. You did that, but we did that. Even after you did all of this, we did this still. Right? Okay. Uh, we'll keep going here. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up at 27. Okay? Therefore, you gave them into the hands of their enemies. Right? Who made them suffer? Uh -huh. Then in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven according to your great mercies. You gave them saviors who saved them from the hands of their enemies. Those would be the judges. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you, and you abandoned them into the hands of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you rescued them according to your mercies. Ah, oh, he does it over and over again. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. They acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your ordinances by the observance of which a person shall live. They turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you were patient with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets. Yet they would not listen. Therefore you handed them over to the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them a full end or forsake them. For you are gracious and merciful. Uh huh. Now, therefore, our God, our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, keeping covenant and steadfast love, do not treat lightly all the hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings, our officials, our priests, our prophets, our ancestors, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until today. Meaning, would you give us grace again? You see how we're suffering? Would that move your heart once again? Like it did, like I just was praying to you, God, all those times when we were stupid, our ancestors were stupid, and they rebelled, but they sought you again, and then you showed mercy. God, uh, we're suffering again. It's happening again. History is repeating itself again. Would you repeat your grace again? If history repeats itself again, and we're suffering for being stupid, then God, would you also, once again, show us grace and mercy? You've been just in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully and we've acted wickedly. Yeah, our kings, our officials, our priests, our ancestors have not kept your law or heeded the commandments and the warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and in the great goodness you bestowed on them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they didn't serve you and did not turn from their wicked works. My gosh! This especially took place in the place where you just blessed them and, and prospered them and protected them. And 
And that's where they did what they did. Here we are. You know, it's kind of like, I, to me, it's like, uh, so he, he, God, here we are. Slaves to this day. Here we go, full circle. Slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Now, are they actual slaves? No. Literally, no, but figuratively, yeah. yeah. Slaves to their own psychology, right? Okay. It's slaves to the land that you gave our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. Yeah. Did you catch that? No, 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 listen, listen again. Its rich yield goes to the kings who you have set over us because of our sins. Government has taxed us to death. Government has no lack. Government is taking everything. Isn't that, do you hear, you read what's going on there? History repeats itself. It's repeating itself now. They have power also over our bodies. Ooh, government's trying to get power over your bodies right now, folks. Globalists are. Yeah, read the book of Revelation. It's going to happen. Okay. And our livestock at their pleasure, and we're in great distress. Our livestock. Huh. So that would be their food, their work, horses, their vehicles. Okay. You know, Abraham Lincoln said something similar, didn't he, in uh, his address to the nation during the Civil War? Remember that? Thursday, the 30th, April, 1863. He called it, you know, day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Remember this? He said, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to their own dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance, wow, genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed Whose God is the Lord. Amen. Kind of similar to that priest's prayer. Isn't it? Yeah. The awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins. Wow. To the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Intoxicated with unbroken success. You know this sentence. Mm. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. National sins. Man. There we are. So uh, God was good to his people when his people weren't not good to him. Mm -hmm. God sent a prophets to teach him, to warn him, but the nation refused to listen. He was merciful to forgive them when they cried out for help. He was long-suffering with them as he repeatedly rebelled against his word. When Israel disobeyed him, he was faithful to bless them when they turned, when they asked for his mercy. Faithful to forgive. And God is willing to give his people many privileges. Uh, but he won't give them the privilege of sinning and having their own way forever. And that's why God finally lowers the hammer. But even after that, he shows forgiveness. Now, let me say this. I, I think it's important to rehearse your own spiritual journey every so often. I want you to listen to me. It's important to rehearse your own spiritual journey every so often. And why don't you write it down if you haven't already? Simply summarize it like this, like chapter 9. Summarize it in a page or two. Um, Put down the bullet points of the highs and the lows. You know, how God has seen you through. You know, when was the discipline? Just give an abridged version of, of your life. And then go back and read it regularly. Because you're going to need to. To guard you from being stupid again. 
Because you'll, when you'll, you'll read over it, and if it's a truthful autobiography brief, you'll go, okay, I'm tempted to be stupid again, but according to this, you know, my past, every time I've been stupid, these things happen, but, you know, uh, I'll, um, I'll cut short the, the classroom experience, and I'll, I'll turn now, and I'm going to turn to God, and as for his mercy and his grace. And if you've been stupid and you forgot all about it, go back and you read it, you go, oh my gosh, God was merciful afterwards, and God, I'm going to ask you again, be merciful. Um, we'll finish this. Um, in these verses, I, I want to say the, the people of Israel did some soul searching. You know, and they came to the conclusion that their current situation was not God's fault. <laughs> <laughs> right? But did you notice? They also kind of realized it wasn't really their fault, but it was the fault of their ancestors. How many times did they say, our ancestors, our ancestors, our ancestors, our ancestors? Because who are the people there? For the most part, the people here are who? People born in captivity. They were there how many years? 70 years in Babylon. Right? Okay? Um, 70 years. Now, there's some folks who were taken captive when they were kids and they were there, but the vast majority, that's why they're going, uh, all we've ever known is that country over there because of how, what our ancestors did. And maybe, you know, some of these folks again are saying, I mean, imagine, imagine being the parent or the grandparent who's returned and you're hearing your kids and you're watching them suffer and hurt because of what you did or you refused to do. I want to camp out on that a little bit, okay? This, this is important. Um, they were living out the results of the sins of their ancestors. And they, they came to God and they admitted the truth that God had been faithful but they had not been. Their ancestors had not been, and maybe some of them. And to be honest, since, you know, with themselves, nobody's perfect, they of course would have to also say, and we are also sinful people, and maybe some of them started dabbling in some of the uh, false religious beliefs there in Babylon or in ancient Persia, okay? But I want you to think about this. Our addictions carry long-term impact. Pastor Walter will tell you, He's been, you know, he, he's, he's offering that celebration of recovery thing, okay? He, he's a guy to talk to if you're dealing with this stuff. But, but our addictions carry long-term impact. And depending on our addiction, the impact on our children and subsequently our grandkids uh, on down the line can be devastating. I mean, you've all heard the generational curse. You've all heard of that? Okay. That's, that's not something you uh, read specifically or with that language in the Bible, but the essence of it is there. And it's simply that it's something that's passed down from one generation to the next, but it's really not a curse uh, as much as it's a um, sinful addiction that was not dealt with, that has become a living part of that family. And it's gonna remain that way until somebody stands up and says enough. So I think Eli is a great example of that, the high priest in Samuel's day. Right. That's like a perfect example of that generational curse. Absolutely. Because of him not disciplining his sons. Accountable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yep. So uh, I think that's what the children of Israel right, are doing right here when they return from, is, uh, from uh, you know, exile. Um, and, you know, they did a soul searching of their lives and they said, enough. It stops here. You know, um, you know, and it's all right to admit the truth about what brought us into bondage. In fact, you better name it. Um, you need to identify what it is, admit what it is, uh, or you're not going to get free from it. Uh, and this may well involve the wrongs committed by our parents or other family members. I mean, it's perfectly all right to express our anger and our regret over what has been done to us. And yes, we have the right to hold others accountable and grieve over the neg negative effects of their actions. I think it's all part of the real picture. But uh, this is crucial. Uh, it's not all right 
to use this as an excuse for our wrong choices and staying in bondage. Amen. You did this to me, so that's why I'm going to act like this. Amen. And I deserve to stay this way, you know, pitiful, angry, uh, whatever, because you did this to me. Your grace abounds to be sin all the more. Yeah, right? I mean, listen, you know, our relatives, uh, they may be partly responsible for bringing us to the point we're at, but we are the only ones responsible for moving on to a better place for ourselves and, and our family. Uh, and the children of Israel, they came to this realization. I mean, they could have easily chosen to remain in exile and rebelled against God because their ancestors did. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, listen, there's going to be times when we all have to come face to face with what is within us. Amen. And in America, my gosh, we've always said, now is the time. Well, all the more, it's now. Amen. You know, and so tomorrow, National Day of Prayer. You know what? Spend the day doing this. Let's repent of our own sins and the sins of the nation. Um, you know, uh, General Flynn, how many of you were here Monday night for that? Good. Packed house, standing room only. What did you think of it? Very powerful. Right? Powerful night. Wasn't it great? It was better than I thought it would be. Yeah. So, um, uh, I got a little time alone with, with General Flynn before everything started. And um, just getting to know each other a little bit. And, um, and he said to me, he goes, um, I don't know if we have time to, you know, to turn around. You know, I, I just kind of, by certain things I said, he knows where I stand, and, and I said, that's, that's my concern, too. That's our concern. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, if, is it too late? Well, it's too late when it's too late, but not until it's too late, right? Yeah. So until it's too late, we've got to act like it's not too late. And then, it's strange, but it's, I swear, what's in the scripture is that God's looking for people who, even after God says, it's too late, they act like it's not too late, and they really get busy trying to get right with God, then God is looking. Amen. Come on now. And then that's when God says, okay, I'll relent. There's still life left, you know, in these people. That's the idea. Amen. All right? All right? So, um... Uh... Uh, you know, the reality check on our own lives when we really face what's in us and the stuff that keeps coming up and the ruts we're in and the decisions we keep making, the alliances we keep making, the relationships we keep starting, these things that we go, oh my gosh, it's happening again. Oh my gosh, I can't stop myself. And you go, why can't I stop this? I mean, it's going to cause some pain and down, downright sorrow. It should, right? Especially uh, when it's being called out by somebody else. I mean, it's painful when somebody else points out our shortcomings. Amen. Uh, especially when we've been ignoring or justifying them. And, uh, uh, th but this is how it goes with our addictions. Right? Sometimes it takes an intervention where some people that love you enough come around you to say, we love you, and it's out of our love for you and concern for you. We don't want you to keep doing this thing, and so we're here to... Do everything we can to help you change direction. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we try to, to hide. We try to ignore stuff. Um, until we recognize, you know, these things for what they are. They just also remain an, an active part of our lives. And when we begin to do a sincere soul searching of ourselves, you know, as required um, in, in the word. Even though it's painful, uh, I tell you, we need it. And I, I want you to remember some of the, the issues that Paul found in the Corinthians church. And, and remember, he wrote about it because on Sunday mornings we're going through Corinthians. And I, remember this? Remember when he said this? I'm going to read it to you. The, the, he, he says, well, he, what he says in the first, he also repeats in the second, second letter. Uh, but um, he almost says the same thing, but I, I'm going to read it. Uh, here's 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, in a few weeks. So chapter 15, by the way, Pastor Walter's got this Sunday. You want to hear it? For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice that 
you were made sorrowful, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. Mm -hmm. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, everything he had written about in 1 Corinthians. Remember, because 1 Corinthians, the whole thing's an indictment. By the time to get to 2 Corinthians, he's going, huh, my, my tongue lashing really got to you. And you took it seriously. I mean, it's exactly a replay of what we just read in Nehemiah. So, uh, how else will we close? It's, it's 8. I um, don't want to say anything. A couple more things. Can you handle a few more minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd say it, it, it's normal to want to hide from personal examination. I hate it. But it's got to be done. You know, if we ever want to get free, um, you know, this is what we do. And if, I'll tell you, if we never do it here on earth, the day is going to come when we're going to have to. You know, we're going to actually have to face them uh, with the complete truth about our life. The Bible tells us there's going to be a day coming when an inventory is going to be made of every life. And nobody is going to be able to hide. Remember what John saw in his vision? And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. See, that meaning the great and the small, the most famous people in world history, the most invisible, unknown people in earth's history. He's just going, nobody gets a pass. Okay? I saw the great, great and small standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, this is every human being that's ever lived. Even the saved one. The saved ones, us. We're all there. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades were then thrown into the fire after those in them were judged, everyone according to their deeds. Uh, then he says, uh, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, we talked about what that was, right? Do we need to go into it? Uh, listen, I, you know, I can't control what you believe. Uh, but I can share with you from his word that uh, that day is coming when we're going to stand before him. And um, it's scary. And it's scary to me. Now, as far as I understand, and I'll tell you, the Bible doesn't give a whole lot of detail according to the judgment that the unbeliever goes through and the judgment the Christian goes through. And it looks like what a Christian actually goes through is more of a, of a judging of their works. Remember that, you know, the wood, hay, and stubble? If we did stuff for us, for our own applause, you know, for our own ego, burns up. You know, but if it was a sincere, actual, humble, completely genuine service, giving Jesus the glory, hey, it's refined, like pure gold, right? I am afraid I'm going to have maybe that much gold and a big old bonfire of the stuff that's going to go up in flame that, you know, I did it because it gave me a flesh buzz. I got attention. Made me feel good. I did it for me. I've said before, I'll say it again. Um, uh, we are never free from ourselves. We are never, ever fully free from ourselves. I'm never fully free from myself. I mean, there might be little moments, you know, when we're free from ourselves. And we are ser sincerely, sincerely, totally focused on Jesus. And everything in us just seems to just be about Jesus, pointing to Jesus, excited about Jesus. And we kind of forget about ourselves. But for the most part, eh, we think about ourselves. And, and when we do stuff and talk, you know, we, you know, and for preachers and teachers, we like to say stuff that might impress people. Well, that's not going to turn into gold on that day. Anything that we do for us is going to be wood, hay, stubble. You hear what I'm saying? 
So I, I'm actually fearful of that day because um, I'm afraid I got very little that's going to come out pure. Don't you think God knows, Jesus knows, that uh, the hand of the devil is always on your shoulder? Yeah, yeah. So doesn't God know the hand of the devil is always on our shoulder? Yes. Um, and, you know, I know God is just. He is fair. He'll take all things into account. And, but I just know that, um, you know, I just, I know me. I can't speak for anybody else in this room. I know me. We can't always blame it on the devil either. We have to accept the fact yeah. that we have the freedom of choice. And sometimes yeah. it's just our own sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, right. It's not an excuse. It is yeah. It, it is something to remember that you have to keep in mind at all times uh, because it, the pressure on that side is toward the self gratification and all of that. All of that, you know, rather than, than uh, thanking the Lord at every stage. Yeah. Now, I hear what you're saying. You have to keep working at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um,. I'll wrap it up this way. Um, when John says anybody whose name was not in the book of life, they'd be thrown into the fire. Um, you know, everybody whose sins have been paid for by the death of Jesus, um, their names get to stay in the book of life. I think I've said before, it says your name is blotted out of the book of life, which means everybody who's ever lived, who's alive, is in the book of life. And it's in the book of life until your last breath on earth. And then if you have not let Jesus pay for your sins, then your name is blotted out of the book of life as if you've never lived. You see what I mean? As if you never existed. And, and strangely, I think what's going to happen in heaven, this is my thought, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I think um, if we're in heaven and our name, those whose names have been blotted out, won't even come to our minds. Because if they do, I'm not sure if heaven will be heaven for us because we're so busy grieving over the people who are not there with us. And I think almost God would erase our memory of those people. Can't take a bullet for it. It's not the Bible, but I wonder if that's the inference there. Name is blotted out as if you never existed. It seems like it would since he's making all things new in the earth, new Jerusalem, new heaven. Because if there's no pain, there's no sin, there's nothing bad. If we yeah. get those members with us, then nothing would be Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the celebration, you know, yeah. walk around, yeah. take a roll, see if there's nothing. Yep. You know, you, you enjoy who is there. He says that heaven, heaven is perfect. Yeah. So our, our job is to uh, keep reaching out to family members, friends, keep sharing the gospel, keep giving them the invitation, um, pray for the timing, the right words. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, I just say this is the time to ensure that our names are in the book. Everybody's name in the book? Yeah. Everybody's name is in the book? Yeah. Your name's in the book? Yeah. What if your name's not in the book? Would you know? Yeah. Okay. So I just trust everybody in this room, your name's in the book. Because that means you've all said, Jesus, I believe you are God and you died. You paid for my sins. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, you rose from the dead, um, and you're the victor over death, and you're going to bring me to life, and you're saying those, you're agreeing with him about those things that he accomplished for you, and it's very important that you say, and I agree with you, I have nothing to offer to, for my salvation, not one good work, I don't have anything to offer, to contribute, to add on, uh, you know, as some necessary addition to what you have done on the cross. Everything was accomplished on the cross. You did it all. I'm completely writing 100% on your coattails. Right? You've said that to him. Your name's in the book of life. All right, and then we live that way. So uh, I want to say, you know, it doesn't matter how bad your life is or how bad it ever was. God has enough mercy to cover it all. And that's the whole point of the cross. Right? And if we accept his mercy, um, when we begin to do our soul searching, we know that whatever we find, God is greater. Amen. Whatever you find, whatever you have to admit, 
Whatever you have to say, oh my gosh, I don't want to have to admit this about myself or face this about myself, but this is what I am, this is what I've done, here's what I've caused. But then you also know that God has mercy far greater than your sins. I want to remind you one more time. Amen, right? Amen. And the, and the Lamb of God bled and died for our sins. Amen, he did. The Lamb of God did. So um, I'll, I'll tell you something I've said before, but uh, my dad was a pastor years ago. When he was younger, uh, in his earlier years uh, as a pastor, he had a woman come into his office and lay out a whole bunch of sins that she had committed. Uh, and said, I don't believe God is able to forgive me of all my sins. Mm. And she was just adamant. Just, but I think she was begging to see if my dad had something to say. Like, oh, that's not true. Yes, he can. But my dad said to me, um, as he was retelling this years later, he said, uh, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. She was so convinced that God could not forgive her. Mm. And it, even, you know, yes, he can. And she goes, no, no, he can't. Look at it. Da, 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 da. And uh, uh, she just seemed to be more convinced than, you know, about her being unforgivable. And then my dad said it was years later that um, he found the words. And if he had the chance, he said he would um, tell it to her if he could find her. And it's this. How dare you hold your sin above his cross? How dare you say that what you did was greater than what he did? How dare you say the evil you did was greater than the good he did? Now I turned that into a song. I put that on my album in 93 called, How Dare You? When do we get to hear it? You don't get to hear it. It's, wait, it's waiting for resurrection. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> How dare you hold your sin above his cross? How dare you say what you did was greater than what he did for you? Because that's what we're saying in effect. My sin's so terrible. Really? So my bad is greater than his good? Really? Is it possible yeah. somebody like that would not let him forgive her? I mean, to the point where it's like, I mean, you're, you're basically saying that Jesus, I reject you, you know, and then becomes blasphemy. Yeah. Sounds to me like she couldn't let Jesus forgive her because she couldn't forgive herself. Definitely. Isn't that right? And boy, right? Forgiveness is everything. You've got to forgive yourself. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll pray. We'll get out of here and we'll call it good. Colleen Murray, would you pray, Sal? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be back with our church family. Um, thank you for your words and how they come through Pastor Scott um, to just have us be closer to you um, with every word that was shared. And Lord, if there is anybody in this room that has any crack um, or anything that they need to repent from, Lord, have them know that everybody in this room, um, we are iron, that sharpens iron. And we are here to support um, one another through whatever storms um, this world brings. So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together. Um, I do pray that everybody gets home safe. And I pray that everybody um, takes the opportunity tomorrow um, to be in unison with the world uh, praying, praying for our nation, praying for the world to repent um, of the things that we need to repent from, and praising the Lord for all of his mercies and his grace that he just continues to show us, and we pray that he will continue to show us that. May every single one of our family members that doesn't know you, Lord, uh, you place a shepherd in front of them that yes, speaks Lord. the way they need to mm -hmm. hear you, um, that maybe the family members uh, can't, um, or they're just not listening. Lord, give them eyes to see, give them ears to hear, and uh, knock off any of that darkness that's in their hearts, Lord, and have them turn their lives over to serving you and making disciples that make disciples that make disciples. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. In your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Colin Marie.